Welcome to What Are You Sporting About podcast, a podcast about business, employment, sports, and entertainment to help educate, support, and guide you to your next level. Here's your host, Attorney Savania DeBarros. Hi, everybody. I am back, Savania DeBarros, the protector of athletes and also the founder and principal attorney of the S.L. DeBarros Law Firm, where we represent six and seven figure business owners. And don't forget the best selling author of two amazing books, What Are You Sporting About?, which inspired this podcast and my newest release, Athletes Making Moves, Secure Your Future by Protecting Your Name, Image and Likeness. Today, we have a guest who I met on a previous panel that we both were on. And I absolutely just loved her energy. (laughs) You know, sometimes when you're on panels, um, you have to keep your mics off so that you're not interrupting the the other speaker. But I could tell I'm like, okay, Chelsea is definitely saying some stuff back there in the background. Um, And so I just love your energy, love everything that you are doing and where you currently are in your career. And so we're going to talk about some of that stuff today, guys. So look, let me just tell you, who Miss Chelsea, or should I say Dr. Chelsea Day is. She is a clinical and sports psychologist um, with a psych D in clinical psychology. She specializes in mental health and performance enhancement services with colleges, Olympics, and professional athletes. Uh, Currently, she is employed at Ohio State University, where she works individually with athletes from all 36 teams and is the designated team psychologist for 14 teams, which is a lot to manage. She lives in Columbus, Ohio with her husband and toddler daughter, who I've seen make little, you know, appearances (laughs) on our last live. Um, And in her free time, she enjoys carpentry and traveling the world. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yes, I'm glad to have you here. And you know what? I also love traveling the world. Um, As a matter of fact, next year uh, for three months, I'm going to be living in Portugal. Yes. Yes. I'm I'm super excited. But I want to know, just starting off from you, what are you sporting about? You know, right now I am in in the time of year where things are finally slowing down. You know, the the kind of schedule in college sports is such that you know, you grind out in September, October, November, and you get a breather before it all starts again. So it's been such an active semester with mental health on the forefront of conversation in sports, with NIL and and the emergence of that in sport, you know, with just the chaos that is the post-ish, post-COVID season, that first season back for some of our sports having two seasons in one year, which is insane. Um, And so, you know, I am I'm trying to survive, but but really have been thrilled to, to be able to get our student athletes through kind of the first normal ish semester in in over a year. So that's what I'm sporting about lately. Oh, my gosh. And I'm sure that you've, you know, dealt a lot with the after effects of COVID and how it's impacted your student athletes. Can you talk to me a little bit about what have been some of the common issues that your athletes have faced and what have you guys been able to implement on campus or things that they can implement in their own personal lives off campus so that, you know, they can build up and have a certain amount of of mental and emotional resilience during a very tough time? Yeah, so right now in, in college sports specifically, we're working with Generation Z, which is the most connected generation of all times and the loneliest generation of all times. And they were already that. And um, so this is the first generation that grew up with technology that, that has had social media since forever. And COVID really threw a wrench in that, that it amplified the loneliness while also increasing the reliance on technology um, for that connection. But you know, as many of us have experienced, this is awesome and it has limitations. And so the reemergence into kind of life um, after all of this time in isolation, or at least very limited interaction, has has really amplified a lot of anxiety. So anxiety was already the the top presenting issue for for everybody, but particularly college aged individuals and specifically our student athletes that social anxiety is on the rise. Um, Performance anxiety is on the rise. We've got fans coming back into stadiums. We've got 
kind of the reemergence of their high profile nature. So even going back into the classroom and having to interact with non-students and, and increasing some of that anxiety there, um, we've really seen that that increase. And it's also a post-Olympic year. So um, we had 12 Olympians coming back and, and that's a really hard time, whether you went to trials and didn't make it, whether you went to the Olympics and regardless of performance. So we've got this really complicated picture of things. Um, and so we've really had to focus on how do we meet them where they're at? How do we how do we continue utilizing technology in a way that increases that access because we have more requests for services than ever before, which is a wonderful outcome. But how do we continue to, to lean on that for them to utilize it, to meet them where they're at, and to provide tangible skills as they kind of re-enter um, that social landscape and, and start to maybe decrease some of the reliance on the social media, on just technology to, to regain those skills. No, that's good. What, what, you know, how has the, I guess the communication skills been impacted with, you know, COVID-19 because, you know, you're taking outside of, like you said, the social environment where you are constantly with somebody, talking to somebody, strategizing with someone, you know what I'm saying? Like, what what has been that issue that you've been able to see? Yeah, you know, Gen Z is also they're they are um, they're hated on as being poor communicators, but it's they aren't great verbal communicators. Uh, but they are incredible written communicators. Now, maybe not in the ways we'd like. Certainly, they're doing shortcuts with words, but they're really able to articulate their feelings in written word. And so, you know, a lot of the focus is is twofold. So, both for the recipients of their interactions. So, maybe for those of us that aren't Gen Z, or those of us in the older generations helping coach us on how to utilize that written communication that, that they're really skilled at that maybe isn't our strong suit. Maybe we prefer verbal communication and then helping kind of coach them up on how do we take, how do we, how do we tell them like, you're actually a really good communicator. How do we develop skills to reduce the anxiety so that you can take your, your good written skills and kind of transfer those to, to that communication. So they really are good at that stuff. They're just not used to speaking about it. And so um, I actually think that's one way that NIL stuff might actually help, even though, you know, that that'll be kind of both positives and negatives, but they're going to have to communicate. They're going to have to be creating content. They're going to have to be talking to people and continuing to develop a lot of that communication other than just with teammates um, or, or coaches. So uh, it's definitely an interesting time for that. Yeah, for sure. For sure. You know, I want to ask you, as you can see, the doors like flying open. So for you guys who are probably catching this um, at a later date and only listening to it, I have I'm working from home with my toddler son who's four. Um, and so we know that kids can come in and, and interrupt at any given moment. And there is definitely some form of a balance. Don't know if I've actually gotten it, but <laughs> I want to ask you um, first part of my question is being a mother because you you are a mother um do you think that's giving you a different set of skills in your job and how you interact with student athletes and then the second part would be um how do you tend to manage your home life as a mom alongside um your job as a psychologist for your student athletes two phenomenal questions so yeah, you know, I think that being a mom has absolutely changed who I am as a as a sports psychologist, um, how I interact with student athletes, and and you know, I it's easy it's it's easy for me to kind of flippantly say I think I'm better for it, but I don't know that I'm better for it. You know, I think that I was I think I was excellent beforehand, but but I don't think that you have to be a mother to be good at it. But I, it certainly has changed my lens in terms of just a different way that I view my role, a different way that I view myself. Um, motherhood has given me a lot of confidence, actually. And so that's really helpful for me. Um, and through parenting, I've also just ingested a lot of different kinds of research about parenting, which I think has also changed my perspective as, as a psychologist. And so I think it's really given me this ability to have a, a broader perspective when I'm sitting with someone, um, understanding myself better and how I interact with people because I have to be more aware of my interactions with my kid than maybe I did in, in other spaces. And so I think that it's really enhanced my ability to be intentional and to be present and to view them as even more multifaceted 
Um, I'm also, it's making me, ma made me a lot softer. Um, and I think in good ways, I was a pretty kind of tough, rough person. Um, and I think that it certainly softened me up. You know, I find that when my student athletes tell different stories about their parents that I, I'll get verklempt more often and I'm like, hold it together. Um, so that's been a really cool transformation for me. And also working in college athletics, it's been really, really neat. And when I was at Indiana, um, I was, I was at Indiana when I had my, my daughter and I kind of got bored during maternity leave and, and like was loving the bonding. But so we would go down to campus and I would like, you know, get my office set up and, and just be around. And, and I also recognized my ability to have a great influence on our young men and young women, um, that our young male athletes were able to see me as a mother being able to, to do my job well and to, to mother. And they were getting to see that. Um, and, and the young women were having an example of someone who was able to have a really cool job doing really cool stuff while also being a mother and, and get to see me embrace both of those. So that felt really cool for me as well. Um, the balance piece has been really interesting. You know, I think there's been kind of pros and cons and, and I think there have been times where I've really struggled with, um, I love, love, love my job. And so before my kid, it was easy for me to do after hours stuff and, and make time for things and have a more flexible schedule. Um, and I still want to do that. Um, and so sometimes I do take things on and, and I feel a little bit bad about that because she's really cool and like so fun um, and like love being with her and want to set a good example of both being a really present mother, but also, you know, really pursuing something that I love. Um, and it's also given me in that confidence space, the ability to set firmer boundaries around my time and protect my time. And I wish that I had felt capable of doing this before having a kid. Um, I don't think that, you know, I leave it. I leave between 4.30 and 4.45. Daycare pickups at 5. I mean, it's like I can pick her up till 6, but I've decided daycare pickup is at 5. And so I'm going to get my kid at 5. And so if someone asks for a meeting at 4.45, I'm going to say, I can't do that. I got to get my kid. Or if I'm in a meeting that's running long, I'm going to get up and leave and not feel bad about it. I wish that I had felt capable of doing that because it shouldn't take having a kid to set boundaries and protect your time. But for me, that has been one way that I'm really able to do that. And, you know, that has been really helpful in my work-life balance, in balancing family, because I get here when I get here and I have a little bit of a flexible start because if the morning is hard, which at three mornings can be hard. And so if I'm in 15 minutes late, I'm in 15 minutes late. And I think before having a kid, I would have felt really anxious about that. And now I'm just kind of like, if you would like to come manage the toddler who I had to wrangle underwear on, you're welcome to do that. We are going on the timeline we're on. So, you know, I think that that's been a really, a really nice piece of it, but it's definitely hard. I, you know, I think kid, kids get sick and I come in tired because they've been up all night um, or when there's contact tracing because of daycare COVID and having to, we found out a few weeks ago. We got a Sunday night, 5 p.m. contact trace, daycare classroom, preschool classroom shut down for a week and a half. I had a full day scheduled. My husband had just started a new job a few weeks prior and he needed to be at an all day training. So it was easier for me. So I'm frantically texting everybody at night like, hey, we got to switch to virtual. We can either do virtual with my kid watching TV on the other side of the screen or we can cancel and reschedule. Um, and so having to have some new flexibility, you know, has been taxing and, and it's exhausting. And I think I've just started doing Pilates, like a reformer class with like the machine. And I, cause I've realized like, oh my gosh, like as we're still in COVID for the toddler age, like we're still in the thick of it with the young kids without vaccines is, you know, it's becoming almost more exhausting than it was before. So I try to find little ways, some are helpful, some are not. And uh, some days are survival mode. Yeah, I definitely um, feel you a hundred percent on that. Cause you know, we talked a little bit off screen before about me working at home and trying to manage everything with, you know, COVID scare at his school and, you know, just trying to make sure that my child is safe, make sure that he also has everything that he needs, um, you know, educationally and also mother to son bonding, uh, which can become extremely exhausting because you are trying to do and be everything for this one person um, all day, every day, you know? And I think people don't necessarily recognize how much energy it takes to put yourself in, in multiple roles with, within just a day, you know what I'm saying? Um, and, and many times you do find yourself being the caregiver, the mom, 
you know, the, what do you call it? Like, let me kiss your boo-boo situation. Um, let me come over here so we can do some curriculum so I can teach you something. <laughs> so you can actually grow up to be a, a solid individual. And so I, I definitely know the, the struggle is real out here for a lot of people who are still in deep in this COVID phase. Um, I actually have a comment. This is actually my husband and daughter, the bottles. He said, wow, we went through the same thing. So <laughs> he definitely knows. He knows what time it is. Um, so being a, a female, a former athlete, a doctor, a mother, gosh, you, you've managed, you're managing so much. And so what I want to know is, are you seeing a great impact on your female student athletes around campus? Um, is do do they get a little bit of insight in terms of who Dr. Chelsea Day is, um, not just on campus, but what your home life looks like, and how is that impacting them or inspiring them to say, you know what, it may be hard, but it is possible. Yeah, you know, I think in psychology there are there, there's a lot of pressure to be a blank slate, to not engage in self disclosure, to kind of be be this, this person. And that works for many people. And that's great. And it's just not my style. It's not my personality. Um, I just don't thrive that way. Um, now, you know, when I engage in self-disclosure, I'm always trying to think is, am I doing this for me or for them? And if it's for me, you know, lock it down if it's, if it's for them. But, but I do, you know, one of the things that's really important to me is particularly with my teams um, and some of them I, I have more access to than others, but really trying to be at practices and be around and be Chelsea not just Dr. Day and, and them getting to see, you know, who I am. Um, I was able to, we, I did a, an activity with our rowing team in the midst of COVID and brought my kid and she helped me lead the activity. And that was really cool. We were using one of her books and um, you know, I really try to be very authentic because I do think that there is that secondary, maybe more passive influence. Certainly what I'm doing in the therapy room, certainly when I'm doing performance consulting, there's really tangible, intentional stuff that I'm doing. Um, but I also think that there is that potential for them to see. And, and certainly we can never have it all, but but we can kind of have it all, right? We can have we can have a lot of a lot of things. We can't maybe have all of everything, but I, I really want people to know that, right? And and depending on what, what their everything is, that you know, you can be a super kind of female forward stay at home mom. And you can also be a professional and an excellent mom. And you can also, and just really trying to provide that breadth. And, and, you know, some of it is, you know, I've got this picture behind me of my kid in Columbia. Um, I keep this little Jordan on my desk. We had little Jordans. They don't fit her anymore, but I can't bear to get rid of them. And, and so that does kind of spur questions. And I've, or her art, it's not great, but it's real cute all over my office. And and so it does kind of prompt some of those conversations. And when I'm out and about outside of the office, you know, I do engage in more casual conversation with my athletes, with my coaches. And I do think, I like to think at least, and it seems to, you know, be able to provide that um, almost passive mentorship as well, right? Being able to see someone doing something that proves to you that you can also do that. Um, and that certainly there are costs to that. And certainly there are, are things I've had to give up to do that. But that now I'm at the point where I kind of get a lot of that back and that the the reward at the end has been totally worth it. And, and I think they see that my passion for my job, I love what I do. And I think that helps as well that not only did I do that and that not only am I engaging in all of these different roles, but that I really like it. And, and I think that that's helpful too. Oh, it definitely is. As I'm going to tell you, like kids, when I say kids, <laughs> I know they're technically adults, but still, yes. um, one thing about it is kids or young adults can really cut through the BS. Yes. And yeah, if you are faking it uh, for some reason or another, they will call you out on it like big time. And if they don't say it personally to you, it's going to get around, you know? Um, and so I definitely know that that authenticity is a level of vulnerability too, in a way where it, it allows for a real authentic dialogue where you could, you could break down barriers that you might not have been able to break down otherwise, had you not been your true self. Right. Sure. And so, um, we all know that when we go into a corporate space or job suite, whatever that looks like, there is a level of professionalism that we do have to bring with the job. 
But we also have to lead with our heart too and figure out what is it that would be reasonable um, and safe for me to share to create a safe environment to cultivate those relationships. Because at the end of the day, we want to we want to make sure that these individuals are fully equipped co- to go out into the world wherever they may go, right? Yeah. Um, deal with whatever situation they may deal with, but to also be able to have a spark around issues that maybe they they would not have thought of a certain way had they not come into contact with you. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, I mean, that's awesome. I talk a lot about um, having mentors and you said that sometimes you're kind of a de facto mentor. Um, but I think you don't have to even put a label on it. People recognize when you've been that person for them. And and that I think sometimes is a huge determining factor in their success. Yeah. And one of my, one of my, um, I guess the coolest thing that's ever happened in my life, maybe aside from having my kid, because that was pretty cool. Um, and like getting married was cool. But I professionally, you know, I had an athlete that um, went through a really tough time. He's talked very publicly about his experience, who was at the lowest of low, I had a suicide attempt. And you know, that was able to work with him clinically, but then was able to work with him in more of a mentor role. And he's now in his second year getting a master's in counseling and wants to do sports psychology. And now we talk more as mentor and colleagues. And it's it's the coolest thing. I mean, there, there could be no greater compliment in my life um, other than being able to feel like the impact is tangible and to kind of see it and and get to come along with it. So getting to stay in touch with him as he goes through this program, not just knowing he's doing it. And, and it's just been really a, an incredibly powerful experience for me. And I think really kind of helps to, to keep me um, invigorated when we're in that, you know, October grind at work of here's why we do what we do. And and he's going to get to do that for people, too. And like, that's so cool to me. That is awesome. I mean, literally saving lives and people don't see it that way. You know, um, I think sometimes, too, we get caught. We could get caught up into, well, I'm just me. You know, like minimizing our own greatness and what we do have stored up inside of us that can actually change lives because you never know what people are going through. You know, some folks can put on a good face, but they're literally they're being torn down on the inside. Um, but to have that success story and to have impacted him in such a way that he can see himself in the role that you're in to also save lives, that is, that's the trajectory that we want to be on, right? We can't get so caught up into the masses that we lose sight of the people that are right in front of us. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Dang, that is deep. I love that. That is so good. It's so cool. It's just the coolest. That is amazing. Well, I want to switch gears just a little bit because we kind of touched on it a bit. Um, We know name, image, and likeness is pretty much everywhere at this point. Um, It's a nationwide issue. Um, A lot of states have enacted this opportunity for student athletes to monetize through like sponsorships, um, some types of endorsements. People are getting social media deals. Folks, I mean, there are athletes who are who have been able to monetize their NIL, like with car dealerships, all types of things are happening. And so I want to know, like, what have been some of the top stressors for your student athletes? Have they discussed issues or problems that that I don't know, maybe centers around a form of anxiety with stepping out into this phase? What have those conversations been like? It's been varied, right? For some, <laughs> it's been incredibly positive. <clears throat> It's been a really great opportunity that's helped them to enhance their lives, to help their families um, in a way that maybe isn't so stressful, that, you know, it, it's been easy, um, depending on who they're working with and depending on the profile, you know, the level of profile of them as an athlete. I think that so for that stuff, you know, it, it's great. And I think I think it's important, I think, for, for equality and equity um, in terms of you know, what departments get from athletes and now them being able to, to benefit in the same way. I think that's huge. Um, you know, I think some of the the pitfalls or some of the things that we probably could have anticipated, but it all happened really fast, right? Like we knew it was coming and then it was here and we were like, oh my gosh, okay. Um, you know, I think that we are seeing some family stressors. So I think there's pressure. Some of my athletes have pressure from their families to pursue as many opportunities as they can um, to whether it's pay for their own livelihood at school or to help support their family because their family needs that. Um, I think that we're seeing, 
some of our, our athletes get really excited about it. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's very, it's very good for the ego to have people that want to work with you. Right. But not realizing what that commitment's going to entail. So, you know, I've got athletes who have things sitting that they need to do a, they need to do an unboxing on Instagram, but they don't get home from practice in class until 9 p.m. And there's no audience on Instagram at 9.30 p.m. for them. And so they can't do it then, but then there's the pressure to do it. And, but when are they gonna find time to do it? So I think there's things like that, that it's creating maybe unforeseen pressures where an unboxing doesn't sound that stressful. Open the box of stuff, talk about how cool it is until you start to try to figure out where it's gonna fit and start to do it in a way that actually benefits the company that's asking you to do it. Um, I think that that some of them did, you kind of didn't go, know it, didn't go in knowing. So they aren't sp- social media experts. And so when they're creating content, is it up to par? Are companies going to come back and say it's not what we're looking for, and they have to redo it and, and some of that stuff? Um, I think there is some of that maybe competitive piece of well, my teammate got this, why am I not? Um, especially if maybe I actually perform better than my teammate, and how did they get this opportunity and I didn't? So you know, again, some of that ego threat. Um, of am I good enough? You know, am I attractive enough? Am I good enough? Am I a good enough person? Um, so I think there's it, it's it's maybe picking at some scabs for people. Um, and so a lot of it is is really, I mean, I think everybody has dealt with it so different. And so I think it's really meeting people where they're at on that. Um, I think that as a psychologist, if I go if I go real deep psychology, um, you know, honestly, I think that it can be really really helpful because while it creates distress for some then we know where those points of tension are, right? So if I am talking about understanding, comparing myself to my teammate because they're more attractive or they get more playing time so they get more opportunities or whatever, whatever, guess what? I now have so much to work with, right? Let's talk about insecurity. Let's actually get to the meat of stuff. Let's actually dig in to some core issues that we can deal with that can be helpful beyond in life. So, you know, I think it's stirring up a lot of more of added stress and pressure. Again, I think it's necessary. I think it's important. I think it's a no brainer that student athletes should have access to this. And so now it's making sure that we're catching up with the additional supports that they need from financial counseling to the obviously the legal consulting about what this all means to, again, how to protect our own mental health and protect our time. And and so, you know, I think it's it's bringing up stuff that, again, it's better to start that now because all of those things were going to come up in life. Right. They're going to leave and get jobs and they're going to need to do the financial planning. They're going to need to manage their time. They're going to need to assess how much money they need to make versus how much time they need to give. So it's better that they're doing it in a safer, protected environment now where there are more supports. Um, It's just I don't know that every university has caught up with providing as much support as they need for now. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And one thing that really um, stuck with me as you were speaking was the confidence, because um, this this will be an issue where it can make or break the individual in their studies, you know, for school, how they perform on the field, sport, whatever your sport is, um, but also how they perform when they do have a business opportunity. You know, I don't think that some folks recognize name, image, and likeness as being a a threefold issue, you know, being a student, being an athlete, and then also being an entrepreneur or business owner, right? There, There are three layers or levels to this thing. And what concerns me sometimes is how the imbalance of one could really screw up the other two yes. or vice versa. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Um, yeah. And sometimes what we don't think could be, I would say, maybe a loose thread in some certain situations could tend to unravel everything. Now you start second guessing everything that you do. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Every play that you're on, you're second guessing it. Every yep. exam or homework assignment, you're second guessing it. And next thing you know, you're in this situation where it's like, oh, my gosh, <laughs> how do I deal with this? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yep. So- I also I'll also be curious to see. I was just thinking about this today. I hadn't thought about it before. Um, come April that uh, we our athletes are getting money for this stuff and they're spending it. And come April having to recognize that they are not employees of any of these companies. And I think that I remember my very first 1099 experience and spending the money in the spot in the summer. And then come April, I was like, 
I don't have any of it anymore. And so, but again, when we think about these added stresses and these added pressures, and I think that's one that they aren't going to, that that's a delayed impact there. That's I think going to skyrocket stress. And for some of our sports, you know, you've got your spring sports that are going to be in championship season. Then you've got our fall sports that are going to be coming back for spring or summer training. And it's just going to be a really wild time. So uh, someone has made a guest appearance. Hello. <laughs> my son. Say hi, Joel. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> he is so ready for mommy to come. Oh, my gosh. But, yeah, I definitely oh <laughs> I definitely agree with um, everything that you've said because, you know, we definitely um, athletes have to start really thinking about the other aspects of business. You know what I'm saying? It's not just a matter of me making a little bit of money here and there to, you know, buy some of the things that I want that I couldn't afford before or help my family out. Um, there are real life consequences to this. And the biggest concern I have is repeating the same situation that our professional athletes have been in, but sooner. Yes. Right. Um, I want this opportunity to be something where student athletes, no, where student athletes can create a foundation to take care of them later, you know, not have to then have the added pressure of working backwards in a negative way, you know? Um, and so I'm glad that Ohio is one of the schools that are putting parameters and putting resources in place to help these student athletes because we we definitely need it and we need to have these things in place earlier yes. rather than later. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. And so um, we're going to wrap up. So if there is one tip or advice that you could give anybody, whether it's a student athlete or not, what would that be? You know, the my greatest piece of, of wisdom and life advice is that nothing matters as much as we think it does. Um, you know, I think society puts a lot of pressures on us, whether we're talking about as parents or performers or employees. And I think that it leads to us putting a lot of pressure on ourselves. It erodes our confidence. It leads us to invest time in things and spaces that are not worth our efforts. And that, you know, if we can remember that most things we do on a day to day basis aren't going to matter five years from now, it allows us to invest in the things that are aligned with our morals, our values and what's important to us, rather than worrying about the things that we think matter, that people are telling us that matter. Um, you know, again, whether that's career advancements, whether that is a missing a practice, whatever it is that we tend to put a lot more weight on things than they than they really deserve. And so you know, being able to to maintain perspective and recognize that stuff matters very little. And so we have to do for ourselves what we need to do for ourselves because we live our lives day in and day out. Um, and at the end of the day, that's that's what matters. Yeah, real talk. <laughs> I have been that person too that have put too much weight or yes. energy into stuff that really at the end of the day, when you hindsight is 2020, Yes. You know, you go back to review those things and you're like, yes. why do I waste so much time in this space? Like it added no value to None. my life, to None. nothing. Yes. 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 Please take Dr. Day's advice. Stop putting weight on things that don't matter that much. Like seriously. Um, if you are a student athlete who is trying to find a resource, some form of guidance to help you to protect your name, image, and likeness. I want you to not wait any longer. Go to athletesmakingmoves.com and get our newest best-selling book, Athletes Making Moves, so that you can be educated in this space. And if you are looking for a college speaker, look no further than the protector of athletes right here <laughs> for your next, next college event. Dr. Day, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. It has been a super pleasure, a joy, and I'm just so glad that you also understand the triggers, the rigors of parenting and, you know, so having little people to come and do their debut um, sometimes happens on camera. So thank you so much for being patient with that. Absolutely. And don't don't sell yourself short. We have your two kids books and we love them. So don't forget our <laughs> children's books. Both are in our house. We have signed copies. So we're pretty big time. Oh, my gosh. Um, I totally forgot about that. It hasn't even been that long ago. <laughs> So highly recommend those as well. Thank you. And guys, so if you don't know, she's talking about JoJo's Legal Adventures, which is inspired by the little guy that just left out of here. 
Um, JoJo's Legal Adventures is a series that is still building, but it brings and introduces legal concepts, like very small legal concepts in a context that they can understand in their own little lives. So if you are interested in those books, make sure that you head over to jjlegaladventures.com to get your copies. Thank you so much for reminding me about that. Of course. <laughs> and listen, one more thing. Go to your favorite podcasting platform and make sure that you subscribe to What Are You Sporting About so you never, ever, ever, ever miss an episode. I am your host, Savanya Ross, Protector of Athletes. And as always, it is my pleasure to educate you, motivate you, and inspire you to your very next level. Until next time, guys. Ciao. <laughs> Thanks for joining us this week on What Are You Sporting About? podcast. Make sure to visit our website, prosportlawyer.com, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever your favorite platform is so you'll never miss a show. And while you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes or iHeartRadio. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. If you like the show, you might want to check out our book, What Are You Sporting About? Attorney Savania DeBarros is available for private consulting at sldebarros.com. And remember, we're here to educate, support, and guide you in your journey to success because we're all sporting about something.